Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual launch event for Nancy Burkhalter's uh, debut historical novel, The Education of Delome, Chopin, Sand, and La France. I uh, just had to mute the music there. I want to thank you so much for joining us. This is really exciting. It's uh, unfortunate that we can't meet in person, but also advantageous that we can meet with people from across the country and across the world. I am coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, it's eight o'clock here. So we will be getting started here shortly, but I'm gonna give it another couple minutes to allow people to filter in. While we wait, um, why don't you comment and let us know where you are from. Um, also, what is your favorite book? So in the comments, just let us know where you're from and what your favorite book is. Um, my name is Colin Mustful. I am the founder and editor of History Through Fiction. I started this endeavor in 2019, and Nancy was actually the first author signed by our press. Uh, we've since signed a second, and I'll be making an announcement about a third author that we've signed. So we are growing, and, and we're getting great uh, responses from people and feedback. So we're really excited about that, and I'm, I'm just really excited to bring these great historical novels uh, to, to people to read. Uh, so again, if you're just joining us, this is a virtual launch event for Nancy Burkhalter's debut novel, The Education of Delome, Chopin, Sand, and La France. Um, why don't you uh, just let us know in the comments where you're from and uh, what your favorite book is. Um, we will be keeping everyone muted until the Q&A session, and then we will open it up, open up your mics, and, and then you can um, have a discussion with the author. And hi, everybody. I am Rachel Anderson. I am the publicist for the book. And you probably uh, recognize my name from the invitation. Um, so I'm the one that sent out the invitations. And I'm also the one admitting people and controlling the microphones here. So um, when we get to the Q&A, we're going to ask people to say, raise their hand if they want to be called on. And I'm going to be looking at names and tracing things back and opening microphones and things. So if I look kind of funny up here in the corner, always moving around, that's why, because I'm kind of man in the store here. So I hope you have a wonderful time this evening. And for those of you who've already read the book, you know that it's amazing. Congratulations, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. I see, I see some people commenting. Um, looks like we have uh, my sisters here. So that's nice. Uh, Danny Glasser from Seattle. He must know Nancy. Um, we have Emma from France Book Tours. We are doing a uh, book blog tour for um, Nancy's book. And so every day a different reviewer is posting a review about her book and doing uh, excerpts and giveaways. And that's through Fan France Book Tours. It's at, you can find out more at francebooktours.com. Uh, looks like we have someone from Chicago, another Seattle. So that's, that's great. Um, I will be doing a giveaway tonight. Um, and in order to participate, you, I'd like you to use the hashtag, the education of Delome. So I'll type that into the chat here. It's just the title of the book with the uh, number sign in front of it. If you use it on Twitter, then you will be entered to win the giveaway. So I will check uh, before the end of the event, I will check Twitter for anyone that's used the hashtag, the education of Delome, and I will choose one person at random and if you are still here but at the end of the event and I've chosen you, then you will get a free paperback copy of the novel that I will send directly to you. So please, if you have Twitter, go on there and um, just mention the book, mention the event, mention History Through Fiction, and make sure you use that hashtag. Okay, well, I guess without further ado, um, I'm gonna bring on uh, Nancy Burkhalter uh, give me just a second here. I'm going to pull up a picture of her while I read her bio. So here we have Nancy as a piano tuner, as a young lady. A resident of Edmonds, Washington, Nancy Burkhalter is an educator, writer, journalist, linguist, and piano tuner. She holds a master's degree in journalism and English education as well as a doctorate in linguistics from the University of New Mexico. She has taught composition for many years in the United States, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Kazakhstan, and Russia. 
Her overseas work led to an interest in comparative education, especially critical thinking. Both observations and research led her to her book and blog, Critical Thinking Now. In 2019, she was also a recipient of Go Back, Give Back, a fellowship through the State Department to train teachers in St. Petersburg, Russia. Burkhalter's novel, The Education of Delome, tells the story of Bilo Delome, a fictional piano tuner for the famed pianist and composer Frédéric Chopin. Set among the chaos and intrigue of the 1848 French Revolution, The Education of Delome combines elements of a compelling, well-developed fictional novel along with accurate historical details, including numerous historical figures, such as the notable French novelist, Georges Sand, and the world's first detective spy and spy master, Eugene Francois Vidoc. With that, I welcome um, Nancy Burkhalter. I can't thank you enough, Colin. You have exceeded all expectations. All of my other friends who have written books are totally jealous what you've done for me, so. <laughs> Thank you. And also, Rachel, you are just out of this world, as you can tell from her background. So <laughs> uh, I want to read um, just the, the first section, the first kind of section of the first chapter on page one and page two for you to get sort of warmed up and get into the book. I thought it would be good if you haven't read it yet. Maybe this will sort of whet your appetite. So this is um, fate, <clears throat> spy, what a stupid, lethal choice. Now I sit shivering on the mud floor of a crowded cell with four walls and a black door. Five other men stare blankly into space. A sixth sticks his hands out the window and cries for food from passersby, anything to stop the hunger, coffee grounds, vegetable peelings, shriveled berries, cheese rinds, the noxious stench from their unwashed bodies and buckets of excrement numbs the nostrils. The sun threatens to overflow, overflow from snow and rain. But what does it all matter? I'm days, likely hours away from the guillotine. I'm innocent, I say to the others, but no one listens, no one cares. There are only the sounds of chin-wagging shoppers and clicking horseshoes. The sparse straw is a paltry shield against the cold earth. I stretch the thin blanket from the jailer over my head and face and sit in a corner farthest from the window. Chill winds blow. There will be no January sun today. Spying was supposed to be a brief stint, something to earn money so I could marry Lily. That delusion has cost me dearly. I want to atone for that, but not with death. My trial is nigh. I will stand proudly in court, pound my fist, and declare that Vidoc tricked me into joining his detective agency, all to help King Louis Philippe control the masses. I will ask the judge, what trump would I? A lowly piano tuner have with radicals wanting to kill the king. I care about wood and wire and wonderful music. How does this mean I betrayed the monarchy? Let those who killed innocent people with their muskets and knives go to their death. That is what I will say. Who will come to my defense? Frederick Chopin would have, but he died three months ago. Georges Sand is volatile and untrustworthy. I hope she can muster fairness. Even so, I doubt her testimony can undo Vidoc's devilish words. He will swear I sided with resistors and hobnobbed with radicals and became a counter spy. Never mind that he lured me with easy money. He is the ruler's vaunted, powerful toady. Loyalty trumps scruples in this man's government. I did everything Vidoc asked of me, reluctantly, I'm proud to say now. Then one day, I fed him wrong information on purpose. It was my attempt to fight the domination of those who ignored the suffering of others. Then Vidoc's wrath came crashing down. Now, here I sit accused of treason, 
jailed, condemned. Wow, that's, that's, that's great. <laughs> Such a great setup. It just builds so much intrigue for the whole novel. And here, if we were in person, here's where everyone would be applauding. So <laughs> we'll have to forego that for now, but uh, you can imagine it. So my first question is, is really about your background. You have such an, uh, a long um, list of accomplishments, most of them academic. And I'm very curious, just uh, can you tell us more about your background and then how did you lead that into writing fiction? Well, I've been, I've been a teacher. I've taught academic writing and nonfiction writing. I don't know, since it seems like the Pleistocene. Um, and I thought that there would be no difficulty moving into fiction. And that was probably one of the rudest awakenings I've ever had in my life. That fiction is, I don't know, it seems to appear in the other side of your brain somehow. And I've said from time to time that nonfiction and fiction share one thing and that's punctuation, <laughs> that's about it. The, the processes are completely different. And uh, it's, uh, although I have been a writer, I mean, in terms of my own diaries and other things that I've kind of concocted, but I never, I never really saw myself as a writer. So, and the linguist part, I guess that's because I just have a mad love affair with, with words. And, uh, and the process is how people learn a language and how people, actually my, my, my work that I did in linguistics was how people acquire literacy as a first and, in a first and second language. So that was something that I focused on for a long, long time. And I came to fiction, I don't know, I guess reluctantly I'd have to say, because I've written two other novels neither of which sing to me like this one does. This is a very personal novel for me. It's, uh, it's very emotional. So uh, this is, I'm glad I kind of got the other two out of the way and put them in the drawer, let them gather dust. And <laughs> so did that take um, a leap of faith, some courage? Um, I mean, what, what made you start to experiment with fiction? I think that the first novel that I wrote was, uh, it was kind of therapy for myself because I was, I had been in graduate school and I, I thought that there were certain people in graduate school who weren't very nice to me. And so I wrote this novel where I killed them all. And it, it just was my own way of kind of controlling my environment. And uh, it, was, it was in fact very therapeutic. So, but I did, I sent it out to a couple of um, agents and they said, you sound so angry. <laughs> I said, yes, I am angry. And so maybe that comes across a little bit too much. So if I do go back and do that, I'd have to kind of get out of that emotional uh, kind of envelope. Well, I'm glad you took it out through fiction, <laughs> not by other means. <laughs> So let's talk about uh, Frédéric Chopin. Um, I was not familiar with his work, even though I, he's like one of the world's most famous composers. Um, so what, what was your interest in Chopin and, and how did he come through in this novel? I was, I, I took piano lessons for many years. That doesn't mean I can play very well, but I did play some of Chopin's music and I liked it. But then when I became a piano tuner, I was listening to a lot of classical music I was down in the basement of this guy's shop in Chicago and working on different things. And, um, and I would listen to the Chicago radio station and there would be a lot of music. And I, I began to develop a real sense of who Chopin was. And uh, I, I found myself very attracted to his music and, and kind of emotionally involved with some of the things that he wrote. And of course then, as I got into piano tuning and worked as a tuner for many, many years, I began to think, you know, he had to have a tuner. He had to because it's too hard to learn. And it's, it takes at least a year to actually show your face as a tuner uh, and sort of be serious about it. So I was... Um, 
I developed that idea and then that skill. And as it went along, I just began to, I don't know, I, I really wondered about his background. And then I listened more closely to his music and learned more about music. And so it was, it was just kind of a, it, it wasn't any one day where I said, ha ha, it's, um, this is what I'll, I'll write about. It was long in coming. So uh, I, I think a lot of people want to know, they, they think the book is about Chopin and it is, but it isn't. Can you describe that a little bit? Originally, I did want it to be about him because I, I found him an interesting character. Although as I got into his life and I realized that he was rather aloof and uh, somebody who I didn't think made a good leading man as it were in my novel, um, and so I decided to invent this piano tuner that it's really, it was really that, um, uh, precise about how I came to do that. Um, and then I figured that that worked out brilliantly because then the tuner could also show a lot about what it's like to be a piano tuner for a famous musician, what a musician depends on in a tuner and kind of grow that whole idea about that, um, you know, two sides of the same coin kind of thing. It's, it's really a very precious relationship. Uh, I know tuners, and I, I never got this, this skilled at it, but I know tuners who uh, would go to like the Grand Teton Music Festival and he would tune for Garrick Olson and, you know, all the people who came through there and they demanded that he be the one who would tune for them because he knew how they wanted it to feel, to sound, to be voiced, um, all those things that go into actually preparing a piano for uh, a pianist. So that, I, I thought that was a pretty neat way to get into talking about all those aspects of being a piano tuner. And I didn't have to do any research on it, which was great. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the the leading man, then the piano tuner, Bilo Delome. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, what was it like creating him and, and getting to know him? Yeah, well, I, I'm not one of these writers who who knows the whole story before she sits down to write it. I'm one of I, I it 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 developed as I went along, and um, I took several classes with uh, a great teacher, Scott Driscoll. And uh, he sort of roughed everybody up in the class in terms of, you know, telling us what really needed to go into a novel. And so I, I, I knew that I had to have an engaging character. I knew he had to have some kind of wound, uh, which was his past, his very uh, brutal father that he had. And uh, so it really went along from there. And then I just sort of tucked in some scenes with Chopin to show how he would interact with him and the kinds of ways that he could sort of show the reader what Chopin was like without having it be about Chopin, as it were. So he was, um, I, I think I've, I, I say that he, uh, he wrapped his story around Chopin and George Sand. And then uh, that's how I got to be able to talk about Chopin. He was, a, he was quite a figure, but he was not easy to get to in terms of you know, understanding him. You think that's true of the piano tuner? Did he have a hard time getting to know Chopin? Uh, yes, he did. I mean, in the beginning, because he, well, I mean, his, he had ulterior motives. He wanted to because, become his tuner because he was being sort of forced to. And so he, uh, and I'm going to read it, the part where they do meet, but he, I, I mean, he, he tried to get into his world. I mean, for, for uh, purposes of of getting to get to know George Sand, but also to, as his own personal idol, he wanted to get to know him. So it, it, it grew that way. Yeah, I can't imagine what it would be like to be in France and Paris at that time, and then to, to find yourself 
close to Chopin and, and his genius. Mm. Um, talk about um, George Sand. Uh, I would say that she is the strongest character, um, a secondary character, but but definitely a, a, a big personality in this novel. Um, and I really enjoyed reading her some of her outbursts. So uh, talk about re research you did about uh, her and, and how you decided to make her into a character in this novel. Mm -hmm. um, well, I knew I had to have her in the novel because she was a big part of Chopin's life. And uh, when I first started to read about, about her, not, not, uh, not about her own works or anything, but about her, I, I really took a dislike to her. And I thought that be, because they broke up two years before he died. And I thought that she had taken very good care of him. And because she sort of dumped him unceremoniously, um, that he precipitously uh, declined in his health. And then he died two years later. So I thought, well, I, I just <laughs> really don't like her. And then it, it, uh, it, it, this was one of the biggest lessons I've learned about writing a fiction. And that is that you can't really dislike a character and do justice to that character because they have a role to play in your novel. It's like, it's like a, a chessboard, you know, it's like not liking one of the pawns or not liking the, the, the bishop or something. I mean, they're there to do a job. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, so I had to put that aside and I had to fit her in as somebody who was his companion, who was, I mean, really then I began to appreciate her, who, who she was in 1830 and 1840 and 50. Uh, she died in 1873 or something like that. What a remarkable woman. I mean, she, she just blew my socks off when I got to, when I got past that whole anger thing. <laughs> and then I realized that I needed to give her her voice. So that's why I gave her a diary entry. Now, I, some people have said, well, you know, that's not how I remember George Saint. That's not how I see her. But that was one of the reasons that I gave her a diary entry, because I figured that she could be a lot more personal and disclosing in a diary than she would in uh, <clears throat> just in a, a regular part of, of the uh, novel itself. So I gave her her own voice and I wanted to her to, I wanted to show her emotions and her reasons for why she did things and, and to aggrandize her as well, because I, I still, I still don't know how she did it. She was, she was in a man's world. I mean, you could say when I was in 1975, when I became a tuner, I was also in a man's world, but nobody ever denied me any access to anything. In fact, tuners were the most remarkable people I've met. Um, but I have to say, I never earned less than anybody else when I was a tuner, than a man. I mean, I earned exactly what they earned. So that was a good point about being a, a woman. Uh, to her back then, but she was she was worth her own place in the sun. That's that's a great way to put it, and it is interesting to think about what she lived through. And and you do a great job bringing this out, especially in the conversation they had at, at No No Hunt uh, at her house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at that time they were they were still debating white male suffrage. You know, can it was at that that time you could only vote if you were a landowner. And, and here she was light years ahead of all them, um, you know, asking for women's suffrage and workers' rights and those things. And, and you do a really good job of bringing that out in the novel. And I think it's also insightful. You wrote a blog post about, uh, about George Sand and, and you talk about you, you, you wanted to like her and you just you finally came to the, the point where she's not your friend, she's your character. And you kind of had to break free from that that, cons that constriction. So I thought that was pretty insightful. Uh, we posted a poll question. I'm sure all of you probably saw that. So um, we'll post a couple others throughout the conversation just to keep you guys engaged in the uh, event here tonight. Uh, next, I'd like to move on to uh, Eugene Francois Vidoc, uh, another great character. 
he's he's definitely the villain um and just historically speaking uh i i didn't know anything about him e either but i learned a lot about him being a, a criminal turned criminalist and in this novel i really think you do a wonderful job of just little annoying details about someone that just make him so irritating that that he's he's so unlikable that it's he just makes a great villain um, so tell us a little bit about uh, Vidak and the role he plays in the novel and, and, and maybe how you fictionalized him. Um, well, I did, uh, <laughs> I actually, uh, it was quite serendipitous that I happened upon him because he was, um, I, I, I thought that I needed a, a spy of some sort or some sort of person that would uh, get me a danger uh, sort of um, character that could work opposite the Delhomme, the piano tuner. And so I got this book about spies and I went through it and wow, there was Vidoc. And I thought, oh, this guy sounds pretty interesting. And then I got his, he has a, an autobiography too, that is just fantastic. And the, all the stuff that he did, he he was just bad seed from the from the word go, but he he managed to turn everything into um, gold. Uh, whatever he did, he was just the biggest opportunist that I've ever seen, um, and he he was a lot of fun because he was so uh, full of himself. And, and, and he had good reason to be because he was quite successful at what he did. Uh, but he, you know, he dressed up in these costumes and disguises and he just had a great time, but uh, he snookered everybody. Except for George Sand at the end. Yeah, yeah, he definitely <laughs> snickered Delhomme. And, and so it's true that he, he dressed in all those disguises? Oh, yes, yes. And more. I just t touched on a few. Yeah. And he really escaped wearing a nun's outfit. And Wow. Well, let's get into the history. This was a very, um, a period of turmoil, not just in France, but across Europe. And so you get into that a bit. Um, Delhomme is kind of caught in between the workers and the elite, and he has to choose sides. Um, and he finds himself in the midst of the 1848 French revolutions, the February uprising, the June uprisings. Um, so talk about that history and how you incorporated it into the novel. Um, I know I've heard people say that some inanimate things are sometimes characters in a novel, like weather or, <clears throat> um, I don't know, some landscape or something. But, uh, and so I thought, well, maybe the history was sort of a character in my novel too, because it, they were, in, as you said, in the middle of all this uproar. Um, not that it had ever quieted down terribly from the French Revolution in uh, 1789 or whenever it was, um, that there was always some rumbling that had been going on uh, in Europe, uh, not just in France, but the events sort of accelerated it uh, when there were different issues that came up. So it was, it, I, I felt compelled to really show how these people were affected by the wars and the uprisings and the danger. And uh, I mean, Delon got caught in it. Of course, his nephew got caught in it. And also, and this is real, that Chopin was in his bed ailing when there was gunfire outside his window. So uh, it, it was, um, it, it was not, <laughs> I mean, it, it was so uh, violent that it was not hard to bring it to life in the novel. It's, it, but I always felt that I needed to connect my characters to it in some way. Well, I, I found it interesting and maybe kind of sad The after the February uprisings, I, I believe France ended the monarchy and went to a republic, but didn't they go back to a monarchy eight months later or something? Yeah, uh, that was the Napoleon, second, the Napoleon III that came in. He, he said, oh, no, 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 I want a democracy. And then he promptly, 
you know, called himself a monarch. So, but I think he was a lot more benevolent than the other ones, yeah. at least that's what I understand. Well, it, I, you, you definitely got me looking into that, that period <laughs> of history and I, I wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, let's get into the music um, again, uh, something I'm not real familiar with, uh, you know, the fingering and um, all the details of piano tuning and uh, you, you, you really get into Delhomme's mindset. You, you share Chopin's personal journal or, or something like that, that he finds after his death. And that, and you really share some intimate details of what it's like to be a classical musician. Uh, so talk about how you got music, brought music to life in this novel. Well, it's kind of hard to overlook if you're dealing with Chopin and, I mean, it was the golden age back then in, in France. And I don't, I don't, I didn't study where else in Europe it might've been also been, but there were just writers and painters and musicians and just a lot of people that were uh, on the scene back then. And uh, I mean, and, and George Sand knew a lot of them and used to invite them to Noah and, and fet them and think it was, you know, it was just great to have everybody around. She liked the company of, of artists. Um, the, and the music, I mean, there were, there were, there was competition between some of the, uh, the pianists and I mean, it's the same as now. I mean, there's a little bit of professional jealousy and, and I think Liszt who was, most prominent in my book. I, I don't know if there was anybody else that he was friends with or knew that he uh, knew better than Liszt, but he and Liszt used to play together. And, but he, as he grew older and more frail, Chopin, uh, he didn't really want to be around Liszt because Liszt was this big, ruddy, bombastic Hungarian German guy and he would play and he would play so loud that Chopin couldn't be heard. So he kind of wanted to keep him at bay and and there was sniping behind their backs and I know Berlioz and some other people like uh, who, who was a uh, Mendelssohn I think was a friend of his who lived in England at the time. So there they they knew they knew what was going on and well, you have an interesting scene where Chopin is fighting for publishing rights and royalties. And I found that very interesting. It, I mean, it reminded me of much of what life is like today for artists. Uh, and, you know, I think of him as a celebrity who would have been rich, but it, it doesn't appear, it looked like he had some money troubles and then he had to, you know, work hard to to fight for his, his contracts to get, get his share. Is, I mean, is that true? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, he, I mean, he was, I mean, of course, publishers want to get it at the most reasonable rate so they can make money. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, any artist, I mean, look, I spent at least four years writing my book. So, you know, for me to go to somebody and say, well, you know, can you give me $5,000 for this or whatever it is? And they'll say, no, we'll give you you know, 1500 and I would be enraged because they don't see the amount of work that goes into any kind of artistic product. And it's hard to monetize anyway, but um, you know, he had to live and he was a little bit of a spendthrift. He, he, and he liked to appear rich. He liked to appear at least well-to-do. So when he went to these soirees in the evening with these uh, wealthy piano owners, uh, he would show, he had his own carriage and, and horse, as I understand it, uh, because he wanted to look, you know, well-to-do. So that was, uh, although he was not, and he never ate. I don't remember hearing anything about what he ate. <laughs> he was so thin. So maybe that's how he saved money. I don't know, but. Yeah. Um, I, I think I was going to ask you what what is your favorite music by Chopin? Oh, it's his first piano concerto, the second movement, lays me flat. I I cannot get through that without crying and just sort of blubbering. I I went to about three years ago. I went to a concert where they played that, and I I I. I 
I probably embarrassed myself, but there's, it's just so emotional and so uh, pure for me to listen to something like that, that uh, that was, that's definitely my favorite. I mean, it's hard to pull out anything. Um, his preludes, his uh, scherzos, any, everything, etudes, they're all wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I uh, we, we did the podcast, and I I played uh, Nocturne Number Nine Two. I'm not sure the terminology for it, but it was it was wonderful. I really enjoyed listening to it. Uh, let's talk about the cover um, for those who haven't seen it. I'm sure I'm sure you've probably all seen it. I've been blasting it all over the internet. Um, tell us what is what is the scene on the cover, and talk about the creation of the cover. Uh, I actually had nothing to do with that. You hired the most wonderful designer from Mayfly Design. And he came up with this. I think he came up with a couple of choices, but this one was hands down. And this is actually the conciergerie where he was imprisoned. So this is a prison still today in Paris. And only the French can make a prison look like a fairy castle. I, I, I still can't believe it. It's so beautiful inside too. It's got these big vaulted arches and marble floors and it's, it's fantastic. So hats off to him. Yeah, well, I mean, you definitely played a role in, in just let us know what, what you wanted. Um, mm. and, and I don't know if there was a little a, a splotch on, on Yes, man. oh yes. There this magic and change. Yeah. But yeah he didn't want to pick up with that. It, it, it's, it's hard to, well, you can't tell now, but the brilliance of this designer, there was, this is a watercolor and uh, there was some portion here that was, it looked almost as if a, a, some, a drop of water or something had fallen on it and it was washed out. But I thought, no, you know, I don't, I don't like it that way. So he, he must have, done his magic and made it look like this it's it's unbelievable what he did and and it's a I like it because it's a very soft um picture it's uh, it's not a photograph it's a it, it's just uh it's very um moody I think and also what's interesting is that the the uh the the jail it looks out over the Seine I mean, wouldn't you die to have an apartment that <laughs> overlooked the Seine? I don't think that's the way they thought at the time, but it was, um, I thought it was, uh, uh, you know, the French. It's the French, <laughs> can I say? So you, you've seen the vaulted arches, you, you've been there. Was that just uh, for a, a fun travel trip or did you do research specifically for the novel? Oh, absolutely, I did research. I had a whole outline of what I wanted to see, what I wanted to um, experience, uh, the places I wanted to go. I, I saw his uh, Chopin's grave in the graveyard in Paris, Père Lachaise, and uh, because that was something that was involved his uh, brother, no, his son-in-law. No, it wasn't his son-in-law, it was Georges Sand's son-in-law, but he carved a, a profile of Chopin, and that's on his uh, gravestone. And um, yes, I mean, there are very, very many people that are famous that are buried in Père Lachaise. And it goes on for acres and acres. It's, it's, you have to get sort of a map to figure out where this, uh, where to actually go. Well, I, I haven't been, but once this pandemic ends, you know, I'll, I'll add it to my list of places to go. And it'll have new meaning since after, you know, reading and publishing this book. Um, so what do you like most about the book? What is, what do you think is its greatest strength? Hmm. Um, hmm. Well, I've used the word emotion a lot tonight. And I think that's because it is an emotional book for me. It's, um, <clears throat> I think the characters were very passionate. Um, Delon was very passionate about finding a wife. He knew what he wanted. He just he just went about it kind of a cockamamie way uh, by getting mixed up with Vidoc. 
And in the end, he finds what he wanted and he gets what he wants. And his education is that it was there all along. He never really had to take the side trip to, you know, go to jail and all that, get mixed up with a spy master like Vidoc. Um, <clears throat> and of course, Chopin's music is very emotional um, for me. Um, and I mean, a lot of people think that, so it's not, it's not just me, but I mean, it for me in this music. And then also my, my time as a piano tuner was, it's very precious to me because I met so many wonderful people, not just piano owners, but other tuners, um, famous pianists. Um, I used to tune for rock bands and uh, got to know some of them. And that it, it, they just always thought it was really funky that it, some chick would show up to tune their piano, you know? And um, <laughs> yeah, I did have a, a situation where I was in, uh, uh, in the, Veterans Administration building once and in the locked ward and somebody came up to me and they said, oh, you're the you're the lady piano tuner I heard so much about. And and I looked up at him and he was in his pajamas and he had slippers. And I thought, you know, this guy's behind a locked ward. What is going on here? And I, I got a little freaked out. But um, <clears throat> OK, so I didn't enjoy meeting him so much. But I mean, it was a really precious time in my life. It It wasn't tuning is not something that I've really felt that I excelled at. I thought I did very well. Um, but in terms of, you know, knowing every little nuance and th stuff like that. But so I, I wanted to share that with the world. And I did that. I was able to do that through creating this character and then revealing Chopin through him. So that's, that's why it's, um, it's a very, as I said in the beginning, it's a very personal book for me. Well, your writing is definitely very clever, very fresh. And, and I think at some point when we talked earlier, you, you put this second to only to, your, to the birth of your child. That's right. The distant second at that. So, yeah, yeah, of course. I know he's listening out there. So <laughs> I better say that. Um, so just, just uh, for any writers out there, can you just talk about the process from beginning to end? I mean, you can't obviously uh, encompass the whole process um, without writing a dissertation, but um, just from beginning to end, learning how to write, going, uh, submitting your novel, getting it accepted, and, and then the whole marketing and publicity and everything that you've had to learn throughout the process. And what has that been like for you? Well, I happen to enjoy it. I love writing. I love even the times when you don't know where you're going or what should I do with this character or, I mean, it's, it's just writing, especially fiction is, is just a constant um, problem solving. You know, what do you do next and how do you do this and how do I shape this scene and how do I um, put the character, main character in danger and that kind of thing. It's, uh, I mean, th th that's what I learned when I learned how to write fiction. And in these many classes that I took is that there are, there's a skeleton that you have to have, you have, and, and it's the same way in nonfiction too, you have to have structure or you don't have anything. It's, it's like taking the bones out of a body. You don't have anything. Um, so I enjoyed doing that, but it, it wasn't, let's just say it wasn't easy going into class and I would hand out my chapter that I had done and I would be so proud of it. And then I'd go the next week and everybody would have at it and especially a teacher. And I would, <laughs> I would, I walked out of class so crestfallen and I thought, oh, I'll never do this. What's what I'll never, I'll never learn this. It's so complicated. It's like spinning 20 plates in the air at the same time. Uh, and eventually things seat and they gel and uh, you begin to see <clears throat> as you go over it for the 40th time that, and, and you have to go through it at many different levels. You have to go through it like what's the story arc and then what does this character do throughout and have you brought in the character enough? Um, have, you, 
have you paced it well? Have you put in enough tension? Have you, uh, and, and then what about the language? Uh, because to me, of course, you know, here we go back to that linguistic linguist question. For me, I had, and, and also this, this sort of dovetails with my journalism training that I knew that there is no word that you put down that is superfluous, nothing. You hack through. And uh, one time, 20 years ago, I was taking this manuscript completion class and the teacher said, you know, kill all your little darlings, which means don't fall in love with your writing because that, that's the death knell of it. You, you have to be vigilant of what it is that you're trying to create. And, um, you know, I, one thing that really impressed me, I was just watching the, the, uh, the Crown and I was uh, listening to uh, um, Winston Churchill. And I knew from my linguistics training that his blood, toil, sweat and tears t uh, speech was written with Anglo-Saxon words. There are very, very few Latinate words in there because not that the English people would necessarily hear that, but there's such power in those words, in those in the words that come from their culture, that it would be hard to turn away from that. And I realized that I needed to also um, make sure that my words were exactly what I wanted to say. If I used an adjective, I said, okay, why are you using that adjective? That's because you have a lazy noun, get rid of it. If you have an adverb, lazy verb, get rid of it. I mean, I must have like three adverbs in my book and I remember each and every one of them. So it, um, I knew the power of that. And again, not that the reader necessarily sees that, but the effect is uh, hard to ignore. You feel uh, that the writing is crisp. You feel that the writing is, um, you know, tailored, really very tailored to what I wanted to say. So, you know, it's like geological uh, levels that you go down and when you're writing. And then of course you chime in and you say, okay, Nancy, this is, <laughs> fix this, do that. And, and you were spot on with everything that you told me. So I appreciated that. And, it, and you need somebody to look at stuff, but you were always nice. The, the craft is an incredibly incredible intricate and it's it's surprising you really can't understand it until you until you go through it and you're right when it all does work when it all does link together it's subconscious but it is is powerful and you don't get to you know as a reader you don't see all that behind the, the scenes stuff that goes on i saw um the crown just came out season four so um it looks like you have some catching up to do because winston church and guys in the second <laughs> yeah i just started it it's slow <laughs> i have to say it's great writing oh you'll love it it's you okay. can't yeah um so i want to get to your ex your next excerpt uh, before i do um can you tell yeah. us what you're working on now well i'm not working on anything personal i mean of my own writing because i have a client that I'm writing for. So that kind of takes up a lot of my energy, but I've been thinking about this one book that I did. Well, it's, it's not nearly as fleshed out as, as I would like it to be, but originally, I should say, when I first started writing about this, I wanted it to be a two, a, I don't, for lack of a better term, a two-tier novel. I wanted there to be a modern piano tuner who somehow finds Chopin's ring in a piano. And his quest is to uh, determine the provenance of that ring and um, along the way, learn some more about Chopin and tuning and that kind of thing. But he's a much crustier kind of tuner than Delhomme was. And then what I would do was go, my plan was, to take the modern tuner and then every once in a while go back down to when Chopin lived and then talk, you know, develop that story, go back up to the modern one and go down. And I thought, oh, <laughs> after I, I tried working with that, it was so incredibly clumsy to do that. And I realized I had a pretty rich novel down in, in the lower part, as I call it, uh, with, with Chopin. And that's when I stuck with that and I just fleshed that out. 
yeah. I'm, I'm sure you can find a way to get Delome uh, into some more. Um. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I wanted to write the modern novel is what I want to say. Yeah. So, so that might shed some light, but I don't know. Well, this has been a wonderful interview. I think we've all learned a lot. We will open it up to questions and answers from the audience in just a little bit. Uh, but first, why don't you read another excerpt for us? Okay. Sure. This is the part where um, <clears throat> Delhomme actually meets Chopin for the first time. If I can find it, I thought I had it marked. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, here it is, page 50. <clears throat> My new spy mantle, courtesy of Viduc, felt like a hair shirt as punishment for defying my father. Had it not been for my employment situation, I would have resisted, but here I sat. The very fault my father accused me of, weakness in the face of challenge, was now in full bloom. But I had made my bed, now I had to lie in it, hair, shirt, and all. I was officially a royal spy. I had built a solid reputation as a tuner by now, but still work was slow in coming, especially in winter, when many wealthy patrons left for warmer climes. Weeks would pass before another client needed my services, but business always improved when the spring rains swelled the grain, causing it to go sharp. Such is the response of all wood instruments to humidity. As directed by Vidoc, the king's envoy, I prepared to visit Chopin to offer my services. I came armed with several names of clients who would recommend me. Unfortunately, our mutual friend Berlioz was not able to accompany me, so he did me the courtesy of sending a letter of introduction. I wanted to meet the pianist for personal reasons, but I did not dare confuse that desire with my royal obligations. Chopin would see no guile, only sincerity in wanting to become his tuner. Without accomplishing that goal, I would fail to do Vidoc's bidding and delay the necessary funding to buy Gilles' business. But I had to gain his trust first. Today was that day. I set my jaw, closed the door to my apartment, and headed for Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. A late March snowstorm conspired against me. Wind pushed against my chest. Drifts hid the sidewalk and ice sent me sprawling. Blowing snowflakes stung my eyes and speckled my green wool overcoat until the wind whisked them away. I arrived at Chopin's apartment building and made my way to the second floor. Thoughts stirred in me like boys fighting under a blanket. While my intention was not to lie per se, I was intending to misrepresent my purpose somewhat. I paused outside his door, trying to quell the roiling anxiety over my duplicity. I heard a nocturne. Oh, he must be composing, I thought. I should come back another time and turn to leave. But my other self was stubborn. Do it now. I brushed the snow from my pants and wiped my feet. My benumbed hand managed only a faint knock. The music continued. I tapped with my key ring for volume. Before long, the storied Chopin opened the door. He had a pleasant face, framed by light brown wavy hair that fell below his ears. He wore a dark colored velvet jacket and a waistcoat. Yes, he said, what is it, monsieur? Oh, I stood in awe for a moment, but regained my speech. Good day, monsieur Chopin. I bowed crisply as I held out my calling card. Good day, he replied. He took my card and examined it. 
Beaulieu Delhomme, piano tuner and repair, he read out loud. Yes, Hector said you were coming. Oh, so sorry, monsieur, but you made the trip for nothing. I have no need of a tuner, he said, handing back my card. Thank you for coming by. He started to close the door. Excuse me, monsieur, I said, holding it open. I'm not seeking work. The friendship between our fathers has brought me here. I held out the card again for him to recall my father's name. He studied it, then searched my face. Yes, my father knew Adelome. His, his first name was Girard in the small village where he grew up. Do you know his family? <clears throat> Pride swept over me. I clicked my heels and bowed again. Monsieur Gerard Delhomme is my father. Curiosity must have replaced his resistance. He motioned me inside. He took my coat and hat and pointed his chin toward the drawing room as a way of inviting me in and in a not altogether polite way either. Would you like some cocoa, Monsieur Delon? I have just made some myself a cup. I gladly accepted and warmed my hands by the fire as I awaited his return. It was a small apartment with wine colored velvet curtains and several rugs to dampen the sound and discourage eavesdroppers, I surmised. To the right of the fireplace stood his play El Grand. The music desk held an unfinished score with several staff scribbled out and another with a nocturne, the one I had heard through the door. Normally, I would have scolded a client for keeping such a fine instrument just a few feet away from a working fireplace, but this was neither the time nor place and certainly not the person to admonish. That would have been presumptuous. I was eager to get details of both our father's bravery in Poland. Dr. Dittmar had painted a heroic picture of Papa's efforts there. I wanted to hear more about his father's experiences. The composer glided swan-like across the room. He offered me a seat in a comfortable dark blue wing wingback chair. Thin, painfully thin, his body reminded me of a goblet with a too fragile stem. He was taller than I by about three or four inches. He placed the cups on the small round table between our chairs. He delic <clears throat> his delicately formed hands seemed to have an intelligence of their own. We sat for a moment, he fussing with his napkin and I stirring my cocoa. He started to cough and sipped his drink to quell it. He appeared agitated and I soon found out why. I began, how did your father fair after being wounded in the Kosciusko uprising. Papa said he was brilliantly brave to have fought in it. Of course, it ended badly for the insurgents, but Papa was only too glad to help your father get better. Chopin's jaw dropped. Help, you say? He got up. Help? He left my father all alone. He could have died. Now it was my turn to be baffled. But I, took, I was told he took care of him. He traveled all the way from Paris. He risked his life. Is that what he told you? Then you were lied to. I tried to remain calm. My father never mentioned any of this. I learned about it from, <laughs> um, from the director of the medical school. I did not want to bring that up, but it slipped out. Medical school, I thought you were a piano tuner. Oh, yes, well, I am now. Well, let me tell you what happened, said Chopin. He weighted his words and spoke slowly with a thick Polish accent. My father was a 21-year-old Frenchman. The Kosciusko Rebellion broke out in Warsaw. The Poles thought their country was disappearing. Austria, Prussia, and Russia, they all wanted to carve up our land. So my father joined the municipal militia he wanted to show solidarity. He paused to quell another coughing spell. Are you ill? I asked, interrupting. He signaled the unimportance of his cough, but it did not sound unimportant. He continued. 
My father was wounded. The composer got up and paced the floor as he talked. He moved as, as, as if everything hurt. Your father cared for him for a few days and then disappeared. His eyes were a fire. Did I understand the import of what had happened? He looked, his look implied. Your father never came back. He left him there. No way to get help, no way to get food. Well, this was not the story I had been told. I doubted my father would have lied to Dr. Dittmar. I dared not say anything against Chopin's father, especially when my own livelihood depended on luring him into my web. But anger overcame me at this unfounded accusation. I had to leave before saying anything untoward. So I put down my cup, stood, and grabbed my coat off the hook. I apologize. Monsieur Chopin, but I, I must be intruding on your work, I said, offering a slim excuse. But he blocked the door. What explanation does your father have? He asked sternly. Why did he leave? My father almost died. I turned to face him, but could not meet his eyes. My papa did not abandon yours, I said in a controlled voice. The Tsar's men captured him. They they said he was violating curfew and tortured him to get information. I looked at him without reproach. They sent him home, ailing, though he was from his own wounds. He did not abandon your father. I turned and opened the door a second time. My father knew how dangerous Warsaw was, but he risked his life to aid his friend. He was dedicated to his profession and to his friend. Stunned silence filled the room. Neither of us was ready to apologize for the actions of our fathers, nor was an apology called for. Understanding was. Monsieur Delon, please come sit down, he said in a mollifying voice. <clears throat> I wiped my eyes and returned to the chair. We sat wordlessly. The political had become personal for both of us. How long have you been in Paris? He asked after a time. And with that simple question, we started our conversation anew, treading lightly on that broom of sorrow. We talked about performances and pianos. How do you find playing on the instruments of Parisian elite? I asked, happy to change the subject. He uncrossed his legs and leaned forward and spoke with newfound energy about performing at sundry venues, which meant playing on pianos in equally sundry states of repair. Nothing galled him more, he said, than having to make do with inferior instruments that fought him as he played. Some have strings missing, some have noisy pedals. One time I played on a different, in a different key to match the squeak. Time passed as silently as a cat crosses a room. As he escorted me out, he sheepishly admitted that his own piano was ill-situated by the fireplace. Oh, my tuner tells me to move it, but where? He said, looking around the small apartment. I want to, tr I want to rent a bigger place. When I have the money, he said, my play L deserves a better home. Oh, how relieved I was, I had not uttered a word of rebuke. We shook hands. His thin fingers did not return my grip, probably more out of protection than poor manners. How else would he speak through his instrument if they were damaged? If you would like, I, I could inspect your instrument. Uh, nice meeting you, he said, interrupting. But as I mentioned, my needs are, are met by my current tuner. Au revoir, Monsieur Delon. With that, he closed the door. I trudged home in the same storm that accompanied my arrival, happy to have met a musical idol, but frustrated he needed no tuner. I could almost feel Vidoc's eyes on my neck and my pockets clamoring for more money. I love that. Just, uh... Great, great scene, the highs and lows. Yes, round of applause. Uh, I wrote down the line, treading lightly on that broom of sorrow. And I had the thoughts, 
well, here's your next novel, Chopin's father and Delhomme's father in war-torn Warsaw. <laughs> you have the makings of a great novel right there. Yeah, good, good idea. Uh, well, then uh, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, everyone is still going to be muted. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up gallery view here. So if you want to ask a question, um, raise your hand and I will look for you and uh, Rachel will unmute you. You can also use the chat. If we're not able to get to you, just post your question in the chat and I'll be looking through those. Um, so if you can, if you want to speak, just uh, raise your hand and I'll, uh, we'll unmute you. Rachel, do you see anyone? No, but not yet. Come on, there's got to be at least one person out there who has a question. Oh, ah, I see, there we yeah. go, Maggie. All right, well, let me find Maggie. And we'll get to Lori Maggie. next. All right, unmute Maggie. It says ask. To Hi. Here we go. Oh, no, that's Lori. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> Maggie? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we got you now. Okay, great. Hi. Well, so excited for you, Nancy. You worked so hard for this, and, and it's lovely to see it all pulled together and in one piece. Um, so I was wondering, you have such a rich history and, and work experience that you brought to this. How much more research did you have to do when you you said you've been ready, working on it for four years? And I'm just wondering, what, did you have enough coming into it, or did you need to do more research? Oh, no. I, I mean, I'm not a historian. And uh, I had to read about French history, Polish history, um, all the people that surrounded him. And I really didn't know much about Georges Sand. I, I really, uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on about the, the people that, and I had to even check a few piano kinds of sources so I could get some information right about that. But it, I mean, um, yeah, organizing it, <laughs> that that was uh, that was a bitch. So I have to say, <laughs> but all I think all 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 novels are are demanding that way and trying to organizing it and stuff. But I I had a lot of things marked. I I have to say that I'm kind of sloppy in terms of the way that I I uh, do research. I put a lot of sticky notes in things, and I'll take notes on my computer and stuff. But it works for me. It's um, Yes, I did a lot of research. Well done. Yeah, it, and it shows. It shows in the novel. He did a did a wonderful job. And I'm speaking somewhat as a historian. I have a master of arts in history, and I you know I can see it it shine shine through there. Now, Lori, did you want to ask a question? Rachel, could you unmute? Hi, Nancy. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, First of all, congratulations. And um, I want to hear, I want to see the novel about the rock band. I think that could be really good. <laughs> Give you a lot of characters going in a lot of directions. I, and I guess one of my questions is about historical novels. That certainly gives you a lot of content, things to research. But did you find that that also tied you down in a way? Like, it must be really daunting to think I have to come up with Chopin's words. I have to make this consistent with what the world knows about him. If you were doing the rock band, you could just go any direction. Is, was that a help or was it sometimes a, a hindrance? Um, <clears throat> you're right. You're absolutely right that it, uh, whereas if I were to invent a, you know, a novel with people I didn't even know, you could invent whatever you wanted. But on the other hand, you are given some sort of guideposts about who they were, what they did, um, and quotes that kind of help the novel come alive. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, being a historical novelist is... Uh, you can't enter it lightly. You have to um, be brave, <laughs> I guess I should say. And you have to really make sure that you are um, being true to your characters. And I think, uh, you know, some people have said to me, and I think I mentioned this earlier about George Sand, they said, well, you know, that's not how I remember her or how I think of her, but that's how I saw her. And so there is some of that that you have to bring into the novel, which is your own 
reading of their lives and what it meant and that that kind of thing. So um, it's it's definitely challenging. You're right. Follow up on that. You you talked about choosing the diary form for her. That for me that must have been the most daunting. I remember when. This is a terrible thing to say, but when I started reading the first one, I thought, oh, this is the scary part. This is going to be the hard one to pull off because you're actually, I mean, okay, you would say dialogue's the same thing, but when you're doing a diary, then you're really sustaining her voice for a long time. Was, did that scare you? No, not scared so much as I... I really needed to be certain that I was, again, not misrepresenting her. And, um, but the, you know, that diary gave me sort of a little out to uh, be a little more playful with her. And I, I, I don't know, maybe there's a little bit of my, of me in her and that this is how I would have been. I don't know if I would have smoked cigars, but you know, I, <laughs> um, I, she had to lean in, I guess is the current phrase that they use. She had to really do it. And um, I really admired that, but I, 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 there was a fine line I had to, um, I, I, I guess I'm thinking about what, some, what somebody else said to me and what their complaint about her <clears throat> was that she seemed a little too, um, to what's the word? Uh, well, bitchy, I guess works, but you know, she had every reason to, I mean, it comes off to these men at the dinner scene, like, oh, you know, you're so ridiculous. We're laughing at you. And, and so she throws down her napkin and stomps out. I would have done the same thing. So, although I never read anything about that dinner scene, I made it all up, but it's, it, after a while, it wasn't hard for me to see how she really needed to push out, push, push into these, uh, into these men who were so uh, full of themselves, and uh, you know they they had the upper hand. They were the ones who were in control, and it just must have really rankled her. Well, wonderful questions there, Lori. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we'll get to. Uh, one more, well, we'll get to two more questions. I've got one in the chat here. So um, the rest of you listening in, just if you do have a question you want to ask, uh, think about it while Nancy answers this next question. I saw Mary W. She says, what, re what was your reaction? What reaction to your book has pleased you the most? So there's been some reviews out there already. What has, what has pleased you the most? Oh, um, <clears throat> Wow, I'm totally surprised that that people liked it at all. I mean, <laughs> um, I don't know that when I met with a couple of writing of of book clubs, those they were very, very, very close readers and would ask me very specific questions about uh, different aspects of the book and. Uh, questioned me on different aspects. So it was a thrill to know that people are out there actually absorbing everything that I put into it. I mean, one of the things that um, I was told 20 years ago when I was in this manuscript completion class was you never want to write anything that the reader can skip over. Everything has a, has a, a, a place. And so I, I think that uh, what some people said about it was that they loved the amount of history that was woven through it, that the, the plot seemed to be really um, unbelievable in a way. I don't know, I was just kind of overwhelmed by the whole thing. <laughs> well, oh yeah, there's been some good reviews and, and uh, it feels good and, and you've arrived. I, I don't think you need to feel shy <laughs> about that. Thank you. Uh, there's always, a, you know, improvement and in, in different avenues to go as a as an artist, but yeah, you've definitely made it. And and people are already saying, um, "I love this book by Nancy Burkhalter," and I will be looking for her next one. 
Uh, so anyone else want to raise their hand and ask, ask a question? We'll wrap it up with one more question here. I see uh, Evelyn's got her hand raised. Um, Rachel, could you unmute her? Yep, Evelyn, I think you can go ahead and unmute yourself there. Yes. I'm wondering when you, how, how did you even first think of this book? Like what was your first thought <laughs> and what was your elevator pitch when you, you first thought of this book? Oh, elevator pitch. That's good. Um, well, when I did pitch it and I went to a number of conferences and pitched it and they all loved the concept of a tuner because they had never heard of that before. But I, when I actually thought of it, I don't know. I mean, I began, I began uh, being a, a piano tuning apprentice when I was 25 or 23, I guess it was. And um, so it must have arisen through the, the foam <laughs> uh, until the time when I started to write it, which was in about 2006. So I, I, I don't, and I don't know that anybody really has uh, that aha moment. Um, maybe some do, but uh, I, this was definitely an organic process that I had with, with this novel. Um, but, you know, I think about, you know, one of the best questions that um, writers can ask is, what if, you know, what if Chopin had a tuner, right? And I think, well, you know, anybody in a service uh, job, if you do something like, for instance, if you're like a, a CPA, you know, you could think, well, why, no, why don't you be Bernie Madoff CPA, you know, and write a book of, from his standpoint about what happened with Bernie Madoff, or were you a clown in uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus, you know, it's, it's, it's just like taking a famous person and then going off to the side and looking at that person from another vantage point. <clears throat> Uh, it, you know, the what if, that's an that's endless font of, of uh, ideas. Are you a writer? Okay. Yes, Eva, Eva and I are actually colleagues. We were in the same MFA program together. And, and, and uh, she's also a publisher. She's got her own um, oh. poetry publishing house. Sorry, I'm blanking on the name of it right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone so much uh, for being part of this event. This is just so exciting for us, for Nancy as a debut novelist, for me as a debut publisher. Um, I want to reveal the results of the um, polls um, for the first question about which historical figure are you most intrigued by? George Sand won. Um, for the time period that you're most interested in, uh, 1800s and 1700s tied. And I, I should have done a better job with the poll about reading books because everyone here has read 15 or more books. So I guess I should have made it a larger scale, especially considering everything that's gone on this year. Um, I didn't notice anyone using uh, the hashtag, the education of Delome. So there was not a, a winner in, in the giveaway, but please, 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 um, word of mouth, word of mouth. And, you know, nowadays that's mostly through social media, but if you know anyone that might be interested in this book or in our press, please let them know. Um, we have uh, our next novel is called The Sky Worshippers, and that's coming out on March 2nd of next year. Um, and yeah, we're just going to keep moving ahead here. And uh, I think we started out with a, a great uh, novel and it's been, an, it's been wonderful working with Nancy and I hope that once the pandemic ends, she can get out to conferences and book festivals and meet readers in person and get to to, uh, to actually hear the applause rather than, than just imagine. <laughs> uh, so I think Rachel uh, Anderson now, she'll mute, un uh, she'll unmute everyone's mic. You're welcome to, to stay and chat with us or um, this is the end of the event. I do wanna mention also that if you would like a signed copy and you didn't get a chance to get one, um, you can find it at historythroughfiction.com uh, slash store. I'll put it in the chat here, historythroughfiction.com slash store. 
if you want to buy direct through us, then uh, we'll get Nancy to send you a signed copy. Otherwise, um, you can get the ebook, hard copy, paperback through all distribution channels, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and, and all those places. So thank you so much, Nancy. Wonderful job on this book. And uh, it's been a pleasure tonight. Um, again, you're welcome to stick around. Otherwise, thank you everyone for coming. Congratulations, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Silent clapping. That's good. I want to ask. Oh, she's huh? <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask Evelyn. Oh. But she's gone. Oh, I can help you out. I can put you in touch with Evelyn if you'd like. I wanted to know what her poetry uh Okay, um, I'll look it up and, and put it in the chat here. Just give me a minute. I'll find that for you. I just wanted to say hello to Nancy in person. We've <laughs> been uh, pen pals for a while now. Yeah, yeah. Good to My, see you. Yeah, finally. I can't wait for your book to come out. Me neither. Ew. I think you meant the fabulous. Loved every minute. Thank you. Thanks. Good. It was fun. Anxiety. It felt almost like a job interview, but, you know, oh. it, wasn't, it wasn't really. <laughs> yeah. Colin, I want to say hi to you, too. It's the first time I've actually heard your voice and you're hearing mine. Hi. Good oh. to see you. I'm preoccupied here. Give me just a second. Was that Ron? Oh, hi, Ron. Howdy. Yeah, nice to talk to you. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk here soon. Um, I'm going to post Evelyn's uh, poetry publishing company there if you want to check it out, Otherworldly Women's Women Press. I see Emma's here. Emma, thank you. Uh, Colin, that's wonderful also to hear your voice. I don't often see people I work with, so it's wonderful. And of course, to see an NC. And NC, you know, I'm actually French and uh, I've learned a lot of French history. And I was amazed the job you did, especially on the well, on everything, but talking about history, about the uh, the re revolutionary clubs. You did a great okay. job in in putting them, inserting them into the story. And I read a lot about those. I actually recently I did some research for another author about them. So I, re I read a lot of diaries of members of those clubs. So it was fantastic to see them at play in your in your book. And the way you describe La Conciergerie, I visited it not many years ago. So when I read it, I felt I was right there. So thank <laughs> you so much. Yeah, really. Oh, good. I Merci. totally felt it. And the, the hay when you see, you know, where they were sleeping and stuff. Just, oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> You're welcome. Thank you. That's yeah, great. thanks, Emma. It's, I'm really glad we found you and um, just fits perfectly. France book tour. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, what a find. Definitely elevated the uh, status quo with this little reading from what we're, you know, sunk into on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Amen to, have Amen some to that. Intellect. <laughs> Great. Glad to take you away from it all. Fabulous. Thank yeah. you. I think this is the longest my cat has not been in the rooms in like, <laughs> my husband just kind of throws the door and took the animals away. Usually when he's at work, I am like the cat parent. But oh. I have cats like walking across my screen when I'm doing meetings. <laughs> oh, I so love that. One right there. <laughs> oh. I've managed to keep him out of the screen. <laughs> oh. I have one that likes to just sit right there. She'll like flop down right on the keyboard and I'm, and I'm, okay, I gotta move you. I have two of them, and there's a window, and they like to come to the window. <laughs> oh. It's actually kind of nice to not be by yourself all day, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, I have one other question. When you were traveling to answer uh, to re do your research, did you? write things while you were there? Did you take notes on what you did or did you just soak up the atmosphere and then when you got back, use those things? I took a lot of pictures. 
uh-huh. because that helped. Like there was one scene in the Jardin de Luxembourg and um, where the, it's the scene where the kids are playing with wooden boats. Mm-hmm. And, I remember that. And, yeah. And, you know, when I when I have the picture to look at, I can figure out what plants are there or flowers or, you know, the general atmosphere and stuff. So that helps me a great deal. I took a lot of pictures. No, I don't really write, but I knew exactly what I wanted to find out. And and I've done this before with an, with one other book that I wrote. Um, but it, this one was I also went to Warsaw to see um, uh, the um, Chopin Museum there. And that was, wow. I mean, it was fantastic. Um, you know, you can hear Chopin playing, being played on loudspeakers on the street all the time. Um, and, and in Paris, uh, I mean, I, I was far enough along in the book that I knew exactly uh, what I, I needed to get in my mind. Like the conciergerie was, you know, very important and Ile de la Cité and I had been to France a number of times before so um, I kind of knew my way around and I knew uh, how to how to get around so that was good but no I didn't I didn't I don't remember doing any writing there no but I was on, on, on foot the whole time you know looking and soaking it in right like you said yeah I think that's really important you know, Ron's doing a book about 16th century doctor. I don't know how you're going to go do research. What are you going to do? Well, I did it. <laughs> you did? Well, um, yeah, the, the book I'm writing is about an anatomist who lived in the 16th century named Andreas Vesalius. He was a Flemish and wrote a very important a textbook that sort of changed the game in anatomy. And uh, he had a really uh, interesting life. Perhaps the most interesting thing was that he died on a, on a Greek island on the way back from a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And um, I had the good uh, fortune in 2014, which was the 500th anniversary of his birth, to go to the island where he died because there was a conference there about him so uh, that's how I did my research. So I actually was on the island in the little town where he seemed to have come ashore really sick and sort of died shortly thereafter and was buried right there. So uh, that was, that was kind of interesting. What island, my friend is from Greece that was talking, Lori, what island? The island is now called Zakynthos, but at the time it was called Zante of the Zante currents. If you've had any Zante currents, that's where they come from. Yeah. Little tiny sweet things. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> well, that'll be great when that comes out. I mean, doing, well, doing, there's, no, there's no substitute for going to the place. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I think it, it just made the whole thing burst into life yeah. for me. I mean, it was I mean, up until that point. Well, that was, pretty early on in the writing of the book, but I had started it, but going there was just, it just took the whole thing to another level. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. Good. Well, thanks for the plug. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, we're waiting. Tick tock on that, Ron. Come on. (laughs) Do you have any other uh, authors among us? Maybe you published a novel yeah. or you're working on one? Well, Rob Burchard is writing a novel. He needs to speak up here. He's, he's from my class. Yes. He's writing a, struggling through a novel. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was thinking that uh, my novel is uh, what you might call contemporary history. Um it's based on a personal story, but um, even I uh, went back to uh, one of the locales uh, in in the novel and found it uh, most interesting and and very helpful in creating uh, a, a scene and a character. And that was Newark, New Jersey, after it had gone through 
uh, the riots in in the in the sixties, where when a lot of it was burned, and then after the twin towers fell, um, so I went back there and took pictures, and uh, the police uh, promptly drove up behind me and said, "Why are you taking pictures of this subway?" of this rail line you know, they were very sensitive at that point to um to anyone uh including an, an old looking guy who was harmless and couldn't run away from them if, if he tried uh as to why i might want to take pictures and uh, i explained that i was writing a novel and i said I'm, I'm willing to erase these pictures if you want it, or on the other hand, I'll show you the novel. <laughs> and I finally convinced them that, uh, that I was uh, innocent of, of any uh, uh, malintent. Uh, and, and I said, well, I've created a, a rooming house uh, where uh, one of my characters is forced to live. Um, and I described it as very run down and uh, has a bar in the bottom and whatnot. And um, they said, oh, you've, you've created, uh, that's exactly the sort of, sort of place we have in this neighborhood. It was, it, I, it was uh, a really run down part of Newark, which is saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you you do inspire me Liz. to get back to work on my novel. Yes, please do, please do, Colin. Yeah, what are you working on? I think uh, Graciela wanted to say congratulations. Oh, Graciela, hi. Hi, Nancy. How are you? Hi. Congratulations. I really enjoy it. You uh, know, I love a fair with Chopin, so I had to oh, have. Yes. Yes, I know. I, yeah, we've talked about that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's nice to see you. It's, I can't, this is like, this is really wonderful seeing all my friends from Greece and some from Paris and, oh, New York and, oh, gosh. Just I'm just in Seattle, very close to you. You're in Seattle, yes, yes. That's right. Well, you still can. You may as well be in Timbuktu for all that. <laughs> <laughs> still can't see you. Yeah, pretty bad. Colin, what are you working on? Well, I'm right. working on an alternative history. My previous novels are all historical fiction, so it's a bit of a departure for me. Um, I'm rewriting the U.S. Dakota War, which happened here in Minnesota in 1862. Um, in reality, the Dakota, who are native to Minnesota, they were defeated. Um, 38 were hanged in Mankato, and then they were exiled from the state of Minnesota. And I'm rewriting it to have them actually join forces with the Ojibwe, which was rumored at the time that the Dakota leader, Little Crow, uh, was going to ally with uh, Bagonzagig, uh, hole in the day of the Ojibwe. Ultimately, that didn't happen. But in my novel, it does happen. And uh, the Dakota Ojibwe Alliance defeats the U.S. soldiers at Fort Snelling. And Minnesota becomes uh, Minnesota Makoche, a native held and governed land. And uh, right now I'm, I'm in the beta reading process. So I, I sent it out to a handful of beta readers and um, asked them to get it back to me by December 31st. So I'll be anxious just to hear what they have to say. Get some of your own medicine, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's good. When it's meant in, in the spirit of, of helping and construction, then it's good. Yeah. Oh, that sounds, that's your, that'll be your sixth novel, right? Fifth. Fifth. Oh. Still when did fifth. you start working on this one, Colin? This one I started in my MFA program a couple of years ago. So it started as a short story. Um, and I always kind of had the, the idea started a long time ago when I was researching something called the U.S. Ojibwe conflict of 1862 in which Hole in the Day held a few captives and killed a bunch of cattle and war almost broke out with the Ojibwe at the same time as it did with the Dakota. And, and, I, and when I'm doing research, I'm reminded of the rumors at the time that Little Crow and, Ojibwe and Hole in the Day were going to join forces. So that sparked my interest probably 
five or six years ago. Then I wrote a short story in my MFA program and just been working on it ever since. On top of everything else that's going on. Yeah, yeah, I know. He doesn't sleep. That's the, that's the secret. Got to get some sleep, Colin. <laughs> well, actually, uh, I, the pandemic has been a bit fortuitous for me because I work in the school system. I'm a paraeducator and I'm supposed to help students. Well, since I'm not at school, it's a lot harder to connect with students. I'm still available to them, but if they're not asking for my help, I'm just at home and I can work on my writing and publishing. So I've been taking advantage of the time at home to, to do those things. Yeah, but still, <clears throat> yeah, you're, you're remarkable. I have to say that uh, in many ways. Okay. And, uh, and thank for you for your interview questions tonight. They were good. They were very uh, interesting for me to answer. So, and you read the book, which was good. <laughs> Several times. Several times. <laughs> I yeah. understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So look, I wouldn't I wouldn't publish it if it wasn't. Yeah. Well, it was. I mean, I had gotten how many rejections? 30, maybe. You know, and then I was on Facebook one day, and I and I'm never on Facebook, but I was on Facebook and this his, uh, your notice came up and said, hey, I'm starting a company and I'm interested in receiving um, historical novel manuscripts. And I just pressed the button and sent it off. And two weeks later, <laughs> it was, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, I said, oh, this guy doesn't really know what he's doing if he likes my novel, right? So um, <laughs> it's the other ones that don't know what they're doing. That was, that's the thing. Well, it is interesting, and you know, I, I, it was a big kind of gamble for me. Um, for those who don't know, I, I self-published my four novels before this, so that's you know, that's how I started to learn more and more about how complicated publishing. In my MFA program, my training in publishing, and I got to do an internship with Howlingbird Press, and I kind of put it all together, and I thought, well, I know how to do all this. Um, so I can kind of take control of the process and, and be a publisher. So it was the when I first launched it, we did get um, numerous submissions, and that was great. But now, and and just uh, the second year or second round of submissions, I'm getting submissions every day from all over the world. So it's the word is getting out there that we exist. Yeah, and you opened it during a pandemic, which you know already it's a it's a miracle that it's gone anywhere but you you know you have to be dedicated you have to you know I mean it's not enough to have good writing I guess I should say that because you know you have to have a product that you believe in you have to be able to know where to send it and you were very creative in the way that you send it out to book clubs you sent it out to um, bookstores um, and I did some of that, but not, and also Rachel, it was just incomparable in the way that she was doing things too. I mean, the, the three of us were this, this juggernaut, <laughs> um, super, super, I can't, it's really great. And it's, you know, it must be a very, I mean, publishing is a very competitive field. So, and you've got a very narrow niche. Maybe that's good. Yeah. I, I'm I'm learning too. I, I uh, just testing out the waters and seeing what works and what doesn't, and using my experience and education and just trying to make it all work. But it's it's definitely fun. I'm I'm enjoying it and kind of surprising myself. I mean, you have your own insecurities about writing. I have to my own insecurities about editing and uh, what's good and what's not and how to get it out there. But that's been a great experience so far, and I'm really glad that you guys could be a part of this first event for us. Yeah, I really appreciate people stopping what you're doing and, and tuning into this. Uh, it's it's not easy to, to get eyeballs on what it is that you're doing. So it was a very, I wish I could have seen all of you. Um, I know my son was there. He was sort of making eyes at me. So anyway, and I see my you sister. You gotta go study. 
And I also wanted to say if there's anybody out there who's interested in marketing and PR and wanting to learn more about, you know, how to get your work out there, I just put my uh, website in the chat bar. Um, it's RMA Publicity. It's just me, myself, and I. I do all the work. And my background is in media. So I'm mostly going after newspaper, radio, TV, starting to do some things with blogs and such. But uh, most of my background is traditional. So that's kind of where I stick. So I go after like the major trade pubs and like Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, that kind of thing. But um, I'm off. I'm happy to offer a free uh, consult if anyone wants to get on the phone and chat anytime. So you can reach me through the website. But you don't do just fiction, right? No, I do fiction, nonfiction, business, mm -hmm. self-help, YA, pretty much everything. Although I will be honest, I have not had a ton of a ton of success with poetry. Um, I have done probably four or five poetry books. And it seems like typically I'm able to get media, say, in their hometown newspaper. And that's usually about it. Unless it's an author who has a connection to like a, um, maybe say like a university press or something like that. If you're trying to self-publish poetry, it's really tough. One of the best things about Colin and uh, Rachel is that they both get back to me right away. And that's not always the, the best uh, thing to, and a yardstick to, to, you know, determine somebody's um, abilities, but it sure tells you a lot about their work ethic. And that for me goes for a lot. So <clears throat> I love that about both of you. I mean, and Sunday mornings, <laughs> Friday night, they're there, they're working. So super. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm delivering pizzas on Friday and Saturday nights. So <laughs> if you want to get back to you then, it's because I'm driving. <laughs> okay. And on the weekends, I typically am working with my publishing company. Um, I publish the work of teen authors. My son and I started up a publishing company about oh. gosh, seven years ago, I think. Or not, no, it's like 20, wait, 2017. So not quite seven years ago, three years ago, four years ago. And uh, we have 17 books out. That's where the 17 comes from. And uh, so we've been pretty busy. Um, got another one that we're just about wrapped up with that we'll probably get out in early December. And then I have two more that we've accepted that we're working on. So busy, busy. Oh. Wow. I don't know. You people make me tired listening to you. It's, <laughs> I don't know. You know, I'm it's trying to be. East Coast here too. It, it's what? It's getting late on the East Coast here, too, so I'm tired just, period. Yeah, yeah, we ought to wrap this up. Well, it's only I'm going to go have breakfast. Chat. <laughs> yeah, you're in Greece, right, Lori? Yeah, it's 20 till 6 in the morning. <laughs> oh! You <laughs> sweetheart. I screwed up and I, because it said this, I think it, it's the 17th there, right? Yes. So I got up yesterday morning at oh, 4 o'clock. <laughs> I thought, why can't I get on? They won't let me in. What's going on? So, where, where are you in Greece? In, I'm in Athens. Aha. Uh -huh. I've heard of that city. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming back. We appreciate it. Yeah, that was <laughs> I wouldn't have missed it. It was really good to see you. And I want to say hi to Susan because I think we uh, both went to Ohio Wesleyan, right? Is this yeah. is this the, the Owu grad? Yeah. Hi. Yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Lori and I were teachers at Ohio State in around 1980, around there. Yeah, and then she married this Greek guy, and he whisked her off to Greece, and there she stays. It's a wonderful place, though. Wonderful. Yeah, next time you come back to Zakynthos. Let me know. And you, I don't know how much you refer to it in your, your book, but that's a good um, marketing opportunity, too. You could get it to get them to sell it on the island. Why not? Oh, <laughs> Why great not? Idea. It's, a, yeah. it's a big part of the book, for sure. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, a lot of tourists then get interested. I, I know there are some about, there's one about Mykonos, one about Patmos. They, those are like murder mysteries or something, but they do sell on the islands because when you're there, you know, you've gotten an interest in the place. You want to see somebody else's take of it. Rachel, are you taking notes? 
not at the moment. No. I'm kind of tired. <laughs> well, there's a good lead for you, Ron. That's yeah. great. Well, Thank East you. Coasters and and. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Thank you, everybody. I love you all for doing this. Uh, super. All right. We'll end au now. Au I have to say it in French, really. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Merci pour tout. Yes. De rien. Uh, we'll be talking uh, soon.